Hello and welcome to In The Studio. We're here today to talk about the Internet of Food. And uh, perhaps you've heard of the Internet of Things. Well, this is something similar. And to talk to us today about it is Matthew Lang, who is the Principal Investigator of IC Food. And could you please explain to us what that stands for, Matthew? Sure. So. Um IC Foods is the International Center for Food Ontology, Operability, Data, and Semantics, which is kind of a okay. mouthful. <laughs> it's a mouthful. I see why you shorten it to IC Foods. Yeah. Now, uh, each of those words, perhaps they're not all familiar to our audience. So let's start sure. with ontology. What is that? Right. Okay. So. Um, and how does it relate? Sure. So ontology, that's probably probably the, the hardest word to get in that, in that acronym there. Um, it's basically a language that we can use to compute over. So um, computers, you know, philosophers often talk about ontology as um, uh, the way to express a person's worldview or the worldview of a community. And computer engineers have taken that same term and used it in computer science to mean something very specific, which is the actual, all of the words that people use to describe a knowledge domain Mm -hmm. And when we take those words and we come up with a set of preferred terms mm -hmm. and dictionaries of synonyms and things like that, then we can actually compute over that language. So when we talk about food ontology, we're actually talking about uh, making a language about food that we can compute over. And this is a global effort, correct? Indeed it is, yeah. It's, um, it's an international center. Actually, there's, there's three seeds three C's in the acronym IC Foods. So sometimes the C stands for the International Center. Sometimes it stands for the International Conference. And we also have an international consortium of um, nonprofits and government organizations, um, non-government organizations like the United Nations, as well as um, for-profit companies. And so they're all coming together to develop a common language around food so that we right. can improve the human health and nutrition through agriculture and animal husbandry, et cetera. Right. So, so the second O in IC Foods is operability. Mm -hmm. And so when we come up with a common language, we actually make data that's produced by different people, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a food distributor or whether you're a chef or whether you're, you know, um, selling food in a store, um, mm -hmm. to make that a common language that we can compare data sets and enable computation across the entire knowledge spectrum that spans from the environment to agriculture to essentially food itself um, to diet and then health. Diet and health. Um, OK. Uh, that's, there was another term in there, right? We had operability, right. and the next one was data, Data, which and, that's pretty self-explanatory. Right. And then the last one is uh, S for semantics. Semantics. And so semantics really talk about how do these words interoperate? What are the relationships between the terms? So when we talk about ontologies, back to that word, um, and building these computational vocabularies, we also need to talk about the relationships between terms. So. Maybe it's, it's, we talk about how a protein breaks into specific peptides, and those peptides maybe can help certain bacteria in your, gr in your gut grow. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe we're talking about um, uh, the way different um, metrics of sustainability are related to specific growing practices or food processing practices, things like that. So um, being able to uh, use those language terms, standardized terms, and their relationships. That's what enables us to compute over all of this data. Okay. And this conference, you mentioned the conference. You mm -hmm. just recently had the IC Foods Conference. I guess right. the first first one ever. The right? inaugural conference, yeah. And first of its kind. Here at, uh, at UC Davis, here in That's Davis, right. California. And you had something, 70 speakers, correct? Right. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we had 71, to be, 71. To be precise. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, it was it was really a great showing. Uh, it 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 exceeded uh, I think all of our expectations. And 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 to be quite honest, you know we we had a sense that we knew this needed to be done. That mm -hmm. that um, that there were issues out there. Um, and and my my uh, 
co-investigators on the project, the people who are on the, on the, the grant with me to, to, to get this started, um, they span environment, ag, food, diet, and health. Um, so I have um, uh, Tom Tomich, who runs the Ag Sustainability Institute on campus, and Jim Quinn, who runs the Information Center for the Environment, uh, as well as Nick Anderson, who is the um, head of research informatics at the UC Davis School of Medicine. Um, so we, between the, the four of us, we sort of span that entire, and I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a food scientist myself. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we span that spectrum, that knowledge spectrum, and can each identify uh, practice areas where uh, data is emerging, um, as you said, from the Internet of Things, um, that essentially would be appropriate to tag with specific uh, vocabulary terms. So you're trying to get everyone, not necessarily out of their silo, but get everybody together, start agreeing on how common terms are going to be used and how we're going to analyze this data uh, so that everybody can benefit. I, I would say necessarily out of their silo. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, um, we, that, was, that was the need we saw um, to, to, to go back to this idea uh, about the conference sort of taking off. Um, we saw this need to, to get folks out of their silos, um, to enable transdisciplinary research, uh, to enable you know, better commerce, um, to enable people to um, let loose with artificial intelligence that can at once give, you know, predict recipes maybe that would be optimal food that will be optimal for you maybe that you like to eat, mm -hmm. that tastes good, uh, that is also um, produced sustainably, uh, and that also meets your exact nutrient requirements. So my personal um, uh, area of interest in this whole Internet of Food things is uh, personalized foods, and personalized diets. And we can't do that with siloed information. We can only do that if we break down the silos. And the first step in breaking down the silos is this, this common language. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about some of the speakers and the topics you had. These sure. uh, are all, all, they were all recorded. <laughs> they, yeah, <laughs> the, and they, they'll the all be part. up online, yeah. And they're all, they'll all be up online. Um, so my understanding is you had some people come in from Europe as, as well as domestically, which we'll get to. But uh, yeah. Michael Becker, is that, am I pronouncing um, name? Michael Bacher, yeah. Bacher, right, right. Okay. <laughs> the, right. I'm not great with the European. So name. actually he's originally. Oh, wait, he was from Google Food? He's from correct? Google Food, right. right. But actually he's Dutch. Um, so, <laughs> um, the, right. Question. So, you know, Google has an interesting um, proposition where, you know, they feed essentially 100,000 people every day, three times a day. Oh, and, their employees, right. Right. <laughs> they have to feed their employees. And let's face it, you know, Google wants to feed their employees well, mm -hmm. and they want to be sustainable. So here we have one of the, you know, largest companies in the world who wants to do things right. And um, quite frankly, they're in the middle of a, a talent war, as they call it, With in all the Silicon Valley, people. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, paying your programmer, your top level programmers, you know, $20,000 extra a year doesn't really mean much um, compared to making sure they have awesome food um, and that their experience at work is amazing. Um, so, so it's interesting that, um, that we're seeing food become this um, value proposition. Uh, mm -hmm in these large companies now in, in a way that it never really was before. Um, I mean, if you, if you imagine taking $20,000 from a bunch of employees and putting it all towards food, then you're going to actually be able to develop pretty amazing food experiences. Mm -hmm. And so... And health benefits. And health, well, that's, yeah. that's part of the, the, the right. food experience is, is eating something that you know is going to be good for you. And, and you know, I mentioned uh, that uh, personalized foods and, mm -hmm. and, and nutrition is, is what I'm most interested in. And you can imagine that um, there are a lot of variables that go into that equation. So, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you have your own set of values about um, maybe, maybe you don't care if something's organic. Maybe you right. do. Uh, but maybe you really care if there were extra, you know, uh, phosphates put into the environment. Maybe you care about the water use. Maybe, you know, maybe you have right. certain things that you personally care about. Um, 
you know, uh, maybe you have uh, a genetic predisposition to, um, to you know, for instance, I, I, uh, I make kidney stones. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a kidney stone factory. <laughs> and, and um, you know, people want to tell me that spinach is good for me. And, uh, you know, as much as I love this stuff, I have to say no. Mm -hmm. so, so we're getting past this idea where there's a healthy food that's healthy for everybody. Right. So I don't care whether your, your diet is the paleo or the neo or the south beach or the north beach or the whatever it is. <laughs> every diet is wrong for somebody. Right. Except the diet that's right for them. And figuring out how we can do that and how we can do that at a scale, I think, is, is um, it's critical for, for advancing human health. Right. And, um, and so that's just one of the sort of the, the value propositions that we have. OK. Um, let's see. Let's talk about a few of the uh, other guests you had. You also had, uh, well, you mentioned corporate involvement, and Google was there. But right. there was also. Uh, uh, I have trouble with these, but, but Scott May from... Sure. He's got the, the easiest company. name to pronounce. It's yeah, probably that's all of the speakers. <laughs> uh, right. But the company is uh, Giovaudan? Uh, or G uh, the magazine, Givaudan? Yeah. Givaudan. Yeah. Um, so they, uh, they're a French company, and they are uh, one of the top flavor houses in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, this company is very unique in that they work with uh, ingredient companies as well as mm -hmm. food companies, which are separate things, and I can right. talk about that in, in a minute. Um, and they develop specific flavors for these companies to, so that they can deliver consistent food products. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the mantras in, in food science and technology and, and in packaged foods in general is to deliver consistency. consistency. And so, in order to do that, you need to make sure that, um, you know, if the if the, the strawberries you harvested for your jam or something don't taste the same as the strawberries you got you know, last spring, right. how are you going to amend that? How are you going to ensure that those flavors come, uh, come, together. Come, come together in the same way? And what can you do to manipulate that? And that's, that's where a flavor house gets involved. And that also demonstrates how broad the topic is. That it, I mean, right. yeah, this isn't just... It, you know, uh, microscience and nutrients and things like that. It's a, the whole ecosystem. Right. Um, you also had another guest was, uh, now this one is an Indian name, I believe. Well, maybe I may be wrong, but uh, uh, yeah. Shid Shitij Chaba. Shitij Chaba. Yeah. Okay, um, and he was the vice president? Honestly, I don't president? know where he's from. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> but he, I mean, he's, he's the, uh, mm -hmm. I believe he's the senior uh, vice president for research and development yeah. at... Um, DSM, mm -hmm. and they are the, um, the world's largest vitamin maker and um, the first or second largest uh, ingredient company in the world. And, um, and so they're really looking at this evolving internet of food and this right. desire to have a common language mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to enable more commerce, right? So um, essentially to, to reduce the friction and enable um, sort of online transactions in ways that, honestly, we haven't even thought of yet. Right. And um, I mean, imagine, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we came up with uh, hypertext markup language, right? I mean, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was within <laughs> our lifetimes, yeah. right? And, um, and so basically now what we're talking about is, is essentially with these ontologies and the semantics and, and everything, we're essentially talking about creating um, the food equivalent, a, a hyperfood markup language, if you will. And, um, and so if you can imagine the, the amount of commerce that has been built on the internet as a result of HTML. Right. And now we consider being able to, to look at food as it moves entirely through um, the, again, the ag food diet health knowledge spectrum and, and transaction spectrum. Um, there are so many efficiencies that yet to be gained and, and ways to improve it. We, we, we just can't even think of them yet. Okay. But we know that they're out there. Uh, you also had Brad Fenwick, who is a, right. a right. senior VP for, for a company that produces, uh, you says, the world's largest information company. <laughs> well, so, you know, I'm not sure how we measure that thing, right. but, but um, <laughs> they're certainly up there. Right. And... Um, 
So uh, uh, Brad Fenwick uh, is the Senior Vice President of Global Affairs for Elsevier. And they're a very large publishing company, scientific publishing company. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, they have many different academic journals that scientists will publish their information in. Oh. And um, so what we're able to do by partnering with them, by them coming in and being part of the, the international consortium, mm -hmm. um, is to give us tools to mine the academic literature so, so that we can actually compare data sets between authors and, 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 and scientists and then use that scientific data um, essentially for commercial purposes to mm -hmm. enable um, all new kinds of businesses around personalized foods, personalized diets, more sustainability. I mean, one of the things that you know, we're doing here is we're enabling um, businesses to essentially compete to make people healthier, to compete, to make the environment better. We're giving them a standardized vocabulary upon which they can develop metrics mm -hmm. and, and turn that into a value proposition. Um, right now, food is basically, um, you know, and, and has been, packaged foods in particular, um, have been as we say, valorized or you know, value-added component, mostly around flavor and convenience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when you go shopping at the store, you buy based on what things you, you know that you, you like, like and how convenient is it. And those are the two ways that, that companies sort of get you. Um, and we don't have any real metrics on um, how good is it for you, right? right. And we try, um, and the USDA, um, you know, tries in the FDA, they try to regulate health claims around foods, right. but the only vocabularies that we have to use to, to see whether they're actually performing well are disease-based vocabularies from the medical industry. Ah. But the disease-based vocabularies don't talk about health improvement. They talk right. about disease. And you know, it was sort of one example of that is... Um, there's a, um, the National Institute of Health uh, has compiled a, um, this thing that they call the UMLS, the Unified Medical Language System. And um, they, they, they bring in vocabularies from physicians, from physical therapists, from nurses, from people all across the medical spectrum, psychologists, the DSM, which is a right. diagnostic service manual for psych right. psychiatrists, psychologists, all of these vocabularies, hundreds of vocabularies, and if we look through that and we see um, the number of terms that there are, ways that people use the word depression. Right. So everyone's defining it a little differently. Right. Defining it a little differently. And then they try to bring it all together in this unified medical language. So if we look at the, for the term depression, there's, there's over a thousand entries for Ooh. the word depression. Wow. If we look um, for the word happiness, there's 15 <laughs> ways to describe happiness. And 13 of those are related to unhappiness. <laughs> so, so we don't have vocabularies to describe health and happiness. We have vocabularies to describe diseases and drugs that's and diagnoses because that's where all the profit's being made. And so what we're saying is let's give people a language where we can actually have people competing instead of competing around drugs and diseases right. and diagnoses, let's have them competing around making people happier and healthier and more sustainable. And so that's one of the sort of the big push. The big positive outcome you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, right. Why exactly. not have people competing on that ground instead right. of on the, on the other, you know? I, I just actually heard this morning a similar argument about changing the definition of a nonprofit. Why define it in terms of a negative? Right. rather than what they're trying to do, which is, I guess, the new thing they would like is a, a mission-oriented, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful. They'll have to come up with something shorter. But yeah. Yeah, it's a similar... A mo. <laughs> defined in terms of positive uh, goals rather than in the negative of, oh, it's right. what we don't want. Right. So uh, that's pretty interesting. Um, you, you had, uh, we'll mention a few other speakers here that sure. you had there so that the, the audience can get an idea of the, the broad topics that we're covering. Um, you also had uh, Susan Lewis, who is with, with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Right. So, and so, so Susie, Susie and, and her group at, at Lawrence Berkeley, 
they're really providing a model for us to follow. So um, she leads, um, she's the principal investigator for um, the Open Biological Ontologies Consortium, or OBO as it's known. And um, so they already have hundreds of vocabularies that are part of this sort of OBO foundry mm -hmm. um, that describe all kinds of phenomena within biology. And computational scientists and biologists are using these vocabularies all over the world. And um, so they have a really nice model to talk about biology. Mm -hmm. um, but as you know, food um, is part biology, but it's, you know, it's part also chemistry. Part, part chemistry. Yeah. And also when we talk about the food supply, we talk about transportation systems, we talk mm -hmm. about refrigeration systems, things that aren't necessarily biological. Right. So as the IC Foods Consortium um, essentially gets off the ground, we're, we're, we're looking to the OBO foundry as a model for um, how to come up with um, essentially guidelines for developing ontologies around food and, and integrating them with other food ontologies and integrating them with the, the OBO ontologies as well. Okay. And you also had uh, some, uh, some of these people are international, but also domestic. You had uh, government representatives there, correct, as well? Right, absolutely. Um, we have had support from uh, government at the highest levels. We had mm -hmm. uh, Parag Chitnis, who is the deputy director for the National Institute for Food and Ag. Uh, gave a great keynote address on the, the first day mm -hmm. and um, really set the stage for, you know, uh, the USDA is really uh, thinking very forward and positively about this, about how we can align their mission uh, with this broader sort of mission to um, essentially provide a new way to do commerce. And likewise, Karen Ross, the California Secretary of Ag, mm -hmm. gave the keynote on the second day of the conference. And um, similarly, you know, California uh, leads the way uh, uh, in terms of agriculture with a number of specialty crops that we produce more mm -hmm. than any other state. Um, so we have a, you know, there's no better place to be doing this essentially than, than here. Than here. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're, we're running out of time. So this is obviously a huge topic and I'm going to be bringing you some more information, uh, more shows on this in the future. Um, but if you'd like to listen to any of the videos or watch the videos and listen to them, <laughs> uh, uh, you can go to icfoods.org, and there's links there. There's the links to what the conference is about, the, the videos, the speakers, the keynotes, transcripts, all, all of sorts of information. Right. And uh, we'll be back in the future with more on this and, and more on the, the, the ways it's trickling down to the, down to the startup level even, right. um, as well as these high level uh, discussions that are going just to organize the information. So I'd like to thank you, Matthew. Thanks for having me, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching another episode of In the Studio.